Tonight, what people living in tents in Bannerman Park say about government's promise to put a roof over their heads by Christmas. For people living here in the tent encampment on the snow, housing may go a long way, but it may not be enough in the long term. I don't know what to say, but I've just had enough. It's really difficult. We'll have more on this story coming up on Here and Now. Maybe they should be looking at giving it back out to the people who really need it, like food banks, who could certainly use that money rather than buying ads to praise up themselves. Well, this advertisement is attracting criticism from the provincial opposition. Tony Wakeham says the Liberal government is spending to promote itself rather than helping residents. It's smooth sailing again as of today on the Shoal Harbor Causeway Bridge here in Clarenville. So this is what you get for nearly $4 million. And there's a big sense of relief here in this area. It was a vital, vital piece of infrastructure, and we certainly uh, thought it was vital that this causeway would be, uh, would be put back in place. I'm Transportation Terry. That story coming up on Here and Now. This is CBC Here and Now. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. We begin with breaking news tonight. A jury has found 38-year-old Craig Pope guilty of second-degree murder. The jury delivered the verdict just a few minutes ago in Supreme Court in St. John's. The jury found that Pope killed 36-year-old Jonathan Collins in September of 2015. During the trial, the court heard that the two men got into a fight on the street near Mundy Pond Road where Collins was stabbed once. The father of two bled out in the road. This was the second trial for Pope. A jury convicted him in 2019, but he appealed and was given a new trial. He'll be back in court next week for another hearing. Well, the province has made a bold promise to get people out of a St. John's tent encampment by Christmas Eve. There are questions about how that will happen, and the people waking up there every day in the snow are losing confidence. Here now's Jessica Singer reports. Now it's terrible, isn't it? This is where William Whalen sleeps. Not much protection from the wind, no heat, just a pillow in a sleeping bag in a tent pitched on a layer of snow. Whalen has been homeless for a couple months. He's lived under a bridge on Water Street in the Gathering Place shelter and now here in a tent encampment. He hopes this isn't his long-term home, but the little hope he does have is running out. If we can't stay here, we're going to die here, or somebody will. Allows I'll be the first one because I'm ready to give up. And I didn't think I'd ever say that, but it's the truth. Yesterday, Infrastructure Minister John Abbott promised to have people out of the camp and into somewhere warm in the next two weeks or so. We don't want anybody sleeping in a tent on Christmas Eve, so we've got to be, be very focused over the very next couple of days to, to help solve these issues. He said everything is on the table, including shelters or hotel rooms. But Whalen says he has anxiety and other mental health challenges and refuses to go back to a crowded shelter. While a hotel room sounds nice, he isn't convinced he'll be staying in one anytime soon. I didn't believe him at all because I'm still here. And it seems to me like every day someone gives us another promise that we never receive and we're just still all waiting. I don't have any problem going to a hotel. Everybody says that to me and I just get up early hoping I don't miss the bus to get to the hotel, but it never comes and I never get to go there and I'm still here. I don't know what to say, but I've just had enough. It's really difficult. Wayland says helping the people here isn't just about housing. He says everyone sleeping in these tents is grappling with their own set of challenges. They have underlying issues that lead to homelessness and government needs to address those as well. I seem to think that the city wants to, how are we going to get rid of tent city? But it isn't tent city, it's 20 different people that needs different problems solved. For people like William, if Christmas means being in a hotel even temporarily, the holidays could not come quick enough. Jessica Singer, CBC News, St. John's. 
Well, the province is still figuring out what the new cap on oil and gas emissions will mean for the industry here. The federal government announced a cap on emissions from the production of oil and gas yesterday. It will require companies to reduce emissions or pay up. Newfoundland and Labrador's environment minister says this province has a similar structure in place where industry has to reduce emissions, but he's not sure how the industry here will be affected by the new rules. I guess the devil will be in a detail to see how that fits with respect to each jurisdiction. It is a national framework, so each jurisdiction is going to be affected slightly differently. But I know our, our uh, industry or our um, staff are working very hard uh, and will be in constant, constant contact with the federal colleagues to ensure uh, that Newfoundland and Labrador is uh, treated fairly in that framework. Well, the leader of the province's opposition party is questioning the way the provincial Liberal government is spending taxpayers' money. Tony Wakeham says the Liberals are spending money on advertising that promotes them rather than serving residents of the province. Here in Nazmar Quinn reports. We have a new plan to fight poverty. The Liberal government has been spending public money on advertising like this. Our plan will help improve the well-being of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. Thousands of dollars for online TV and radio spots that the opposition says are self-serving. Basically, it appears the Liberal government is praising what they, they have done. You know, they talk about our government and what we're doing and what we've done. Wakeham says the money for those ads should be used to help people struggling with the high cost of living rather than talking about it. We have the largest use of food banks in our province. And I have suggested that if the government has that type of money to be throwing around, maybe they should be looking at giving it back out to the people who really need it, like food banks, who could certainly use that money rather than buying ads to praise up themselves. The Liberal government says nonsense. In a statement to CBC News, it defends its spending on advertising, saying the provincial government has developed many new programs and services to help Newfoundlanders and Labradorians manage the pressures attached to the high cost of living. It goes on to say we have a responsibility to create awareness of these initiatives and communicate how they benefit Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. This has been a long practice of governments in our province and we will continue to do this in the future, it says. Wakeham says it shouldn't be left to provincial governments to decide. He says there should be independent oversight and regulation of how this province's government spends public money on advertising. Mark Quinn, CBC News. St. John's. Well, a big traffic bottleneck in this province has ended. Traffic is flowing today across the Shoal Harbor Causeway Bridge, and community leaders and residents in Clarenville and all along the Bonavista Peninsula are feeling relief. Here are now Terry Roberts reports. It took eight months to build it, but just minutes for the barricades to come down. At exactly 11.37 this morning, the first car went through and the new Shoal Harbor Causeway Bridge was open, putting an end to a traffic headache that's been annoying motorists for nearly six years. A grateful mayor relieved that an important transportation link is finally back in operation. Today, eight months later, the uh, new, new causeway is about to be reopened, much to the delight of myself and council and much to the delight of all our residents. And of course, the mayor likes to lead the way. First trip across the new causeway. It was also a big day for this Trident construction crew. One final walkthrough following eight months of work. For decades, the causeway linked Shoal Harbor and Clarenville. It helped inspire amalgamation three decades ago and was a gateway to the Bonavista Peninsula. But traffic was reduced to one lane in 2018 because of severe deterioration not safe for heavy loads. The crossing was closed entirely in April once construction began, forcing motorists to detour around Shoal Harbor Drive, further congesting already busy town streets. We know it's been a major inconvenience, and we, we, we thank them for you know, being patient with us and being patient with the contractors. It's a nearly $4 million project, cost shared between all levels of government, a replacement bridge that's higher, wider, longer, an important conduit for the town's water supply. 
it was a vital, vital piece of infrastructure, and we certainly uh, thought it was vital that this causeway would be, uh, would be put back in place. Some motorists were eager to test out the new crossing. It was sitting there as a danger for a long, long time, so it was either condemn it completely or put it in new, so I'm glad they put it in new. And special consideration for pedestrians, a dedicated walking lane. We waited a long time for it. Uh, it's nice to be able to walk around the harbour again and get a bit of exercise and also cross, you know, drive back and forth. The mayor is promising a grand reopening in the spring. Will it be renamed in his honour? Pickers Passage might sound nice, but uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see that in my future, so. He says it's been the Shoal Harbour Causeway since it first opened, and that's not about to change. Terry Roberts, CBC News, Clarenville. Well, five people are dead from a salmonella outbreak linked to pre-cut cantaloupe and more than 120 are ill, including two people in this province. The outbreak is linked to contaminated Malachita or Rudy brand cantaloupe sold in October or November. The victims became ill from mid-October to mid-November. The Public Health Agency of Canada first reported the outbreak a week ago. Most of the infections are in Quebec, but cases were also reported in five other provinces. Experts suspect the contamination started at farms. Well, this was the scene around Cornerbrook today where winter storm warnings have been in place all day. Snows covered uh, roads and blowing snow meant some schools were closed today and some kids got to enjoy the snow. And uh, while the snow is still falling out there, road conditions are starting to improve in some areas, especially uh, for the West Coast. Now around Grossmorn area, you are seeing the most snow and still seeing that snow falling. And if we take a look at what's going on, uh, we still have those winter storm warnings in place still uh, from Parsons Pond through to Cornerbrook. And then most of them have dropped up across Labrador McCovic. You are still seeing those winter storm conditions, but things will improve as we head through the overnight tonight and then a new wind warning was issued for Bonavista uh, this afternoon and we're going to see some pretty strong winds through the overnight and through the first half of tomorrow as well. Taking a look at what's going on, we've got a large area of low pressure, a strong area of low pressure offshore ridge of high pressure to the west that is tightening the gradient uh, across the province, which is why we are seeing all of these windy conditions. But if we take a look at this, the uh, right now what's happening as far as snow is concerned, some more snow is developing uh, just to the north there. If I zoom out, you can just see how large this system is. The area of low pressure here, cloud cover extending all the way through to Spain and Portugal. We'll get into all the details when I come back. Thanks, Ashley. A 56-year-old Norris Point man has been charged after a shooting at a home in the town. The RCMP say officers received a call around 9.15 last night that a man had been shot. The shooter was identified and appeared in court today on six charges, including aggravated assault and assault with a weapon. The victim of the shooting was treated for non-life-threatening injuries, and the investigation is ongoing. Well, there is a new consultant keeping watch over the overdue and over budget Muskrat Falls project. The province's utility board has hired Bates White Economic Consulting to monitor the hydroelectric project. Liberty Consulting, the previous oversight firm, said in September that it was giving up the job. The transmission line connecting Newfoundland to the Muskrat Falls Dam in Labrador has been plagued with issues. And Liberty said it was taking too long for the project to be clear for reliable operation. La Farm in Pennsylvania is gearing up for its eighth Newfoundland day. The Christmas tree farm in Plowville has been using the working dogs to pull the trees to people's cars. On Saturday, the farm's owner says about 80 Newfoundland dogs will gather at the farm for the day to pull trees, do farm work and pose for pictures. Good pull, good pull. You want a cookie for a good pull? There you go. So what was once a very small out of the back of our shed business is a full fledged, a uh, huge winter wonderland experience now. It encompasses uh, many acres and it has Christmas tree fields, wagon rides, uh, a little village that has a little Santa shop, fire pits. Um, it's really what we would call agro entertainment. We are the Newfoundland dog farm here in the U.S. Uh, 
we are a family of Newfoundland lovers. Between my brother, myself, and my parents, there are four Newfoundlands, which is quite almost a thousand pounds of dog, if you will. They're very big. And a few years ago, uh, you know, we're very active with the dogs and we know that they're a working breed and we love that they're a working breed. And one of their strengths is in pulling carts. We had a festival, a small festival, where we attached the carts to the dogs and put Christmas trees on them and people could go out into the field, pick their Christmas tree, put it on a dog, a Newfoundland dog, and carry it in. One day I decided to put a video online and here we are many years later, a very famous Newfoundland farm. The first year we did it, we really didn't announce it. We, you know, have our own dogs. We had one or two there who were ambassadors to pull the trees, if you will. And people came and they were just shocked by the size. They were like, this dog is huge. What is, where is this dog from? What can it do? And then they realized they're just teddy bears. And so the word started spreading, of course, on social media, come to Plow Farms. They have Newfoundlands. The dogs are so sweet. You'll never believe how sweet they are. And so it's been a really beautiful way to build affinity for the Newfoundland dog breed. On December 9th, it is going to be our eighth edition of the Newfoundland Day Festival. Um, and every year it grows bigger and bigger. Last year we had probably 60 dogs. So that's a lot of Newfoundlands. Given the RSVPs this year, I'm thinking 80 maybe. Um, and the day starts with one big giant group photo. And then it kind of breaks out into how the dogs want to behave. So some, of course, go to work. Um, and it's really important to know that when the dogs are working, we keep them working. We don't necessarily want people to come up and hug and play with them because we try to give them their task and make sure they complete it. And the dogs feel good after they complete it. This year, my mother just adopted two new Newfoundlands. So the farm keeps growing growing and acquiring dogs. Um, and, you know, we love them. They're part of our family. Uh, my mother has a car that is just to haul the dogs around. You know, it is, they're big dogs. They need a lot of care, but it's really beautiful when you see them work and, and we know that they're happy on the farm. A season of giving, a season of kindness. Let's make the season kind for those in need. CBC is helping support local food banks this holiday season. Visit cbc.ca slash be kind to find out how you can help. Well, the number of people in need of food is higher than ever, especially during the holidays. Recently, some seniors in Labrador West received a free meal. The local Steelworkers Union has been delivering hot meals to seniors throughout the area. Here now's Daryl Din brings us that story. Making sure seniors have a hot meal before the holidays has become a bit of a tradition in Labrador West. The local steelworkers union has been doing it for the past few years. We deliver uh, meals to seniors within the community. The meals have been well received. We love the reactions because honestly there are smiles and hugs and sometimes cookies and fruitcake and <laughs> they just wait for us. The door's opening before we get there, you know. It's time to head to Wabash to pick up the freshly made meals. Today. What's on the menu today? Today they got uh, roast pork with a vegetable hash and mixed vegetables. And thank you. And blueberry and purchased berry pudding for dessert. The first of many deliveries oh, has yeah. begun. Oh, we got some growth for you, buddy. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. On behalf of the steel workers yeah. um, and our sponsors, uh, we'd like to present yeah. you with this meal, buddy. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Are you going to have it for lunch or supper? I'm going to have it right now. Good. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to do. Yes, I'm very pleased to get it. And I'd like to thank all the organizations that uh, went to the effort to do, do this, eh? It's a lot of volunteer time, being an effort put into it, and it's good. How long have you lived in Lab West? About 48 years. I had 45 and a half in the company. Good day. Or, come on, Doug, you're not Yes, going. we'll come on in. Yes, by all means. I'm going to come in, you know. No, no, it's good. All right, appreciate it. More than welcome. No. So, listen, on behalf of the uh, steelworkers, we're very proud to be able to present you this meal. Um, and Merry Christmas to you guys. And you too, man. You yeah. too. Thanks, okay. thanks a million. Much appreciated. Sorry, you get me One less meal to cook. One less meal to cook. A meal that's prepared by anybody else is a wonderful uh, meal.
The union says it has fed hundreds of seniors this month. Six or seven hundred meals. So it's possible that we can be delivering uh, uh, through this. Uh. If you or someone you know hasn't put their name on the list, there's still time. You can add a name by calling the steelworkers office. Daryl Din, CBC News, Labrador City. Oh. And staying with food charity in Labrador, our colleagues at Labrador Morning held their annual turkey drive this morning. It all took place outside the CBC studios in Happy Valley Goose Bay, where plenty of people dropped by with turkeys and cash donations. Here how, here's how things look this morning. I thought it was fabulous, a great community effort to come together to donate some turkeys and lots of cash just a great job by the town of happy valley goose bay just want to bless some families this christmas who are finding it difficult so they can have a hot turkey christmas dinner on christmas day this is the first year since i started doing this that uh, we didn't freeze to death and we didn't have um, any snow coming down and we didn't have any rain coming down. So it was a good turnout by all of the local groups that come to help. And uh, he's gone. It will set, uh, continue for many years to come. But we are in need of new volunteers. We're all, the majority of us are well over 65. My hope is that the younger generations coming up, unfortunately a lot of them don't belong to churches, but that they will remember what, that it went down when they were a child and that they will continue to come forward and volunteer to be part of this. It does your heart well and uh, the good Lord knows what you're doing. Oh, what fun it is to ride one horse open sleigh. <laughs> also glad the weather was nice for today, but uh, we have some improving weather for other parts of the province as we head through the weekend. In fact, the end of the weekend looks pretty decent. We'll have all the details coming up.
it is a real life sea monster. Like it makes the real world shimmer with a sense of the wondrous. People didn't understand it. Descriptions of it seems like something out of science fiction. There's an element of the madcap. There's an element of whimsy. The giant squid to me is also emblematic of swashbuckling adventure. It just seemed impossible. We've unraveled the story of the Kraken. was a blustery day today. I woke up early this morning. I was going to take the dogs for a walk and looked out the window and I was like, nope. And the dogs looked out the window and they were like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just close the blinds, go back to bed. That was certainly uh, the type of morning this morning for sure. It didn't last too long. We only really saw a couple of centimeters in the metro area, but that first couple of hours of the day, definitely uh, not very nice out there on the roads. That's for sure. If we take a look at our current temperatures, uh, the snow that we saw earlier today and then the area of low pressure that brought all that snow actually brought some warmer temperatures as well. And our daytime highs sat above zero for a good chunk of the coast of Labrador. Cartwright, two degrees. Mary's Harbor, two degrees. Same thing for St. Anthony. And that allowed the precipitation to change over to rain for a good chunk of the day in the Cartwright area as well. Uh, not really seeing too much in the way of snow. All of that snow falling further inland uh, at the moment. And uh, down along the west coast of the island, currently seeing it about minus one in Cornerbrook with that wind chill feeling more like minus five. If we take a look at what's going on on the satellite and radar, still do not have that radar online yet. Uh, Holyrood radar expected to come online for Tuesday. Hopefully that happens. Uh, but for the time being, we do have still uh, have that west coast radar. And uh, it is showing some flurry activity, some light snow. Uh, most of that activity, though, is in the Long Range Mountains and expecting that to continue as we head through the overnight tonight. Still have that uh, winter storm warning in place as well. The winds at the moment are still sustained anywhere from 40 to about 60 kilometers per hour all along the northeast coast. You factor in those wind gusts. It's more like 69 in Twillingate, 67 in Bonavista, and in St. John's still seeing uh, winds gusting of 64, uh, 65 kilometers per hour, rather. Bonavista Peninsula expected to see some gusty winds tonight where there is a wind warning, about 80 kilometer per hour winds, but uh, exposed areas may see those gusting in excess of 110. Things will start to get better, definitely along the coast of Labrador as we head through the overnight tonight. Same thing for the west coast of the island. Then we start to see some snow and or showers develop all along the northeast coast as a uh, as the area of low pressure moves in a little closer. Now temperatures will be warming as we get into the early morning hours. So this should change over to rain. I do think in the higher elevations, so we'll still see a bit of snow, uh, but for the most part, all across uh, the coast, you will see conditions greatly improving and eventually by morning for the uh, Gross Morn area. Temperatures tonight, like I said, one, two degrees along the coast. West coast will hover around the zero degree mark. A cold night in Lab City, minus 25. 25 degree difference from the coast of Labrador to western portions of the big land. So definitely holding on to those uh, those cooler temperatures and you're also sitting under clear skies, which is allowing those temperatures to drop. Now, for the most part, as we get into tomorrow morning, eventually this should transition fully to rain, but we're still looking at quite a bit of wind through the day tomorrow. So tomorrow morning isn't gonna be very nice and I do think this will fall as snow in the higher elevations, but that should move fairly quickly, but you're going to hang on to those winds through a good chunk of tomorrow afternoon. Winds gusting upwards of about 80 kilometers per hour. As the day goes on, though, we should see some clearing skies, likely hanging on to the cloud cover along the northeast coast, but the rest of uh, the big land anyway should see some sunshine. We'll just see some increasing cloud for those of you in Lab West, and that will be the story as we head through the overnight and into Sunday morning as well. Also with this, this area of low pressure offshore will likely see some high surf uh, in those north facing coasts tomorrow morning, especially around high tide. So definitely keep that in mind. And as far as the snowfall still to fall, we're likely looking at just somewhere between two to five centimeters of snow zooming in on the west coast. You can see there are bullseyes of higher than that, but they are in the higher elevations. And we've got that uh, the same thing across Labrador as well. Now our temperatures tomorrow are going to be sitting above zero right around where we should be sitting this time of year. 
anywhere from two to about six degrees. Again, those winds very breezy along the northeast coast, gusting upwards of 80 kilometers per hour. Labrador finally clearing out for the most part a beautiful day in Happy Valley Goose Bay hovering around minus two. Hanging on to those cold temperatures in Lab City at about minus 14, but the temperatures are going to warm up a little bit as we head through the next couple of days, especially through the weekend. I'll get into those details coming up. Hi everyone, I'm Jane Aidy, host of Land and Sea. We have a brand new show coming up for you this Sunday. This one is about ocean research and the business opportunities that come with exploring the mysteries of the ocean. But it's also about love and one family's decision to be together so that their children can grow up near their grandparents here in Newfoundland. <laughs> okay, come on, you can sit there. Rex Simmons has great success in the fishery and has done well financially. But for him, there's nothing more important than his family. And so he figured out a way to combine business and family and his love and curiosity about the ocean. Research today of the oceans is so broad. You got the oil industry, you got uh, wind farms coming on stream, you got collecting DNA, you got marine protected areas. All this got to be mapped and, and uh, global warming. So research is going to be here for a long time. I don't think we'll ever have the, all the answers. Rex Simmons and his family are helping get more scientists on the water to gain a better understanding of the ocean, and we'll hear all about that this Sunday. So don't forget to tune in for a show called For Love and Money. It's on this Sunday at 11.30. That's 11 o'clock in most of Labrador. And if you happen to miss it on Sunday, you can always catch it on Monday right after here and now. See you Sunday crippling grocery bills, unaffordable rent, gas tanks that are always half empty. We're in a cost of living crisis and it's taking a toll on families, students and average earners. Join us for a new series as we meet people in this province juggling multiple jobs to make ends meet, burning long hours just to cover the basics. The Grind airs Mondays on Here and Now.
Well, as the temperatures drop, many people are looking to save money by making their homes more energy efficient. Joining me now is Jennifer Allwood with Amerispec. You're an energy efficiency advisor. We're here in a St. John's home and you're gonna give us a demonstration in a bit. But first, can you talk about the energy audit and what are some of the benefits that come from getting someone to come into your home and looking for those weak spots? Well, the energy audit, uh, it takes about two hours to come into your house. And the benefit really is homeowners have questions of what is working in their house, what is not working. You know, if they replace this or do an expensive renovation is it going to make the difference they're looking for, which is to save money and make their house more comfortable. So really we come in with uh, the blower door test, which is part of this. We look at every window and door on the house. We're taking pictures of the house. We're looking at solar gains. There's a lot of calculations to it to see, um, you know, I'm going up in the attic. What's up there? You know, who's up in their attic? Not many people. So I'm answering those questions. How much insulation is up there? Would you benefit from topping up? And then finding air and heat leakage in your house, which is really helpful to people. So, and a lot of times, you know, some of these things could be an expensive fix, but a lot of times they're not. And people sometimes are pleasantly surprised to find out their house was well built. Uh, and uh, you can just answer questions for them. Around your door, right? The test pulls the cold air in, but this is normally your heat going out. It's like, think of your money just going out through gaps in your house, right? But with the thermal test, we can really see where, where are those gaps? Where is this gonna be a big difference for a homeowner? People want to know about um, the money right now. So there's some rebates, there's provincial, there's federal, there's a loan, a $40,000 10-year interest-free loan that Greener Homes is offering to people to do energy efficient changes. So, you know, which ones can you do? Which ones would make a difference in this house, say? Uh, so, you know, it's really good to be able to answer these questions and help just clarify people on what would really make a difference. And if someone wa does want to take advantage of that loan, what are some of the options out there? Like say someone who's on oil and they want to change over to something more efficient. What, what are some of the options out there? So the, the province actually, um, through Newfoundland Power and Hydro, uh, Newfoundland Hydro, they have an oil to electric where they're giving people um, five to $7,000 um, for um, making that change. So let's just say if you took out an oil air furnace and you put in a heat pump central, well, that is that change, right? And so you qualify for that for provincial money. Then there's the federal, which is giving you 5,000 for making an energy efficient change to the house. As well, they're giving 5,000 for uh, oil to heat pump technology mm -hmm. because it's, it's just such an effective type of technology, right? There's also a rebate for getting an energy audit done, right? That's correct. Because you, you have to pay to get the energy audit done, but you'll get money back. Can you talk about that? So in our province, we uh, you get $400 back for the first initial visit, and you get $200 back for the follow-up. So we come in to establish that, yes, you do need the work done, 
uh, for greener homes because they want to know that people really need these things. And then we come back for the follow-up to ensure a couple of things. Um, number one, the work was done, so we take pictures of all of that. And to ensure, say, if you had heat pumps put in, we're doing another blower door test, which is going to show that those units were installed properly, everything is re-insulated, so it gives people a peace of mind about that as well. So you really do need to get the energy audit done in order to benefit from some of these rebates from greener homes, right? Absolutely. Yeah, they're looking for that proof. Mm -hmm. But honestly, as a homeowner, I think it's so important to know for sure what you need to get done. And also, so you're just not wasting money on the wrong renovation when doing something else would be much more efficient for your house. And, uh, you know, it's a lot of times I would find people are really comforted by the fact that their house was way better built than they thought. Mm -hmm. So that's always a nice thing to tell people. Very useful information there. Jennifer Allwood, thank you so much for this. Thanks so much for the interview, it was great.
new cases of COVID-19, flu and RSV are on the rise in Canada. The latest surge in these respiratory illnesses has resulted in even longer wait times in some ERs. And understaffed and overburdened hospitals are urging patients to not come in unless they are extremely sick. Lauren Pelly has the details. At Montreal Children's Hospital, the emergency department was running at more than 150% occupancy for most of November. It's like a uh, six hours wait. We do have a lot of sick children. Hospital officials are ringing alarms, saying a staffing crunch, a lack of family doctors and a busy respiratory virus season are creating a perfect storm. Most patients that are waiting a long period of time usually don't even need to be in the emergency department. If they're waiting very long, usually it's because they should have gone to see a clinic. This quiet crisis is playing out at hospitals across the country. Wait times at multiple emergency departments in Alberta and Ontario are also hours long. This Toronto emergency physician says for minor issues, try to go to a family doctor. But if you have chest pain or you have abdominal pain or you're concerned that you're having a stroke or shortness of breath or something that really requires emergency care, these people should come in. The challenge, she says, is that hospitals are facing the pressure of seasonal illnesses plus COVID-19. So it's just making a situation that was already always bad in the fall even worse. Federal data shows flu activity is up, respiratory syncytial virus activity is too, and daily COVID hospitalizations keep rising as well, hitting 4,600 by late November. Add to all of that, health officials in multiple countries warn bacterial infections such as mycoplasma are also making a comeback, causing a resurgence of walking pneumonia. Typically less severe than regular pneumonia, but it can turn serious. The Public Health Agency of Canada told CBC News that labs are already looking out for it. This is sort of going to be the new norm going forward, that we're going to have this level of infection. We sort of have two health crises that are compounding on each other right now and making the situation in hospitals even worse. And we have a long winter ahead. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. Well, many writers around the world have been shocked to learn their books were used to train artificial intelligence software without their knowledge or permission. CBC's Valerie Wallet looks at the Canadian books and writers in that long list. Author Drew Hayden Taylor had no idea. Wow. My plays, some of my nonfiction, and my novels. That nine of his works were part of books three a massive data set used by tech companies to train artificial intelligence. Well, I, it's a combination of being flattered and being concerned. Almost all of my income has been derived from um, royalties. It, it's literally taking the milk out of my, my cereal bowl um, is very, very, very worrying. A CBC analysis dug into the 190,000 files in books three and found a who's who list of Canadian literature. Margaret Atwood, Alice Munro, Mordecai Richler, Michel Tremblay, Leonard Cohen. Nearly three quarters of all Giller Prize finalists and Canada Reads contenders. Like you can see almost yeah. all of Alice Munro's. Yeah. This technology and law professor says, even though these books are all protected by copyright law, it's not clear that their use for data training is illegal. One of the arguments that's being made is that the, the training um, that is being done is really just extracting data points and information from the work as text rather than really using the works as works. The Writers' Union of Canada is considering a lawsuit. I mean, copyright can be very abstract and hard to understand, but I don't think that, that taking a, pirate, a pirated book from a pirate site and uh, using it for your own industrial purposes. I don't think that's hard to understand that that's wrong. At least five lawsuits mentioning Books 3 and several tech companies were launched in the U.S. Meanwhile in Canada, the federal government is having its second consultation on AI technology and copyright law in less than two years. Valérie Wallet, CBC News, Toronto.
Well, it's Friday, so let's find out who's celebrating. Anniversary greetings going out to John and Viney Burt. They're celebrating 53 years of marriage. Happy 60th anniversary to Bill and Jane Comden of Bard Islands, Fogo Island. It's a golden anniversary for Charles and Annie Burgess of White Way. Happy anniversary to Lawrence and Gloria Mercer of Shears Town. They're marking 50 years together. 50th anniversary greetings also to Nina and Wilbert Heath of Southbrook. Wishing Pleeman and Olga Hadnot of Brig Bay, a happy 70th anniversary. Happy 60th anniversary to Garland and Rhoda Parsons of Norris Point. Congratulations to Harmon and Daphne Fillier of Clarks Beach. They're celebrating 58 years of marriage. Happy 50th anniversary to Everett and Patsy Blanford of Herring Neck. Wishing Eric and Marion Humphreys of Northern Arm a happy 64th anniversary. Happy 51st anniversary to Winston and Bernice Moland of Musgrave Harbor. Lloyd and Bonnie Rogers of Twillingate are celebrating their 58th anniversary. Happy 65th anniversary today to Jim and Reno Driscoll from Carboneer. Congratulations to Gordon and Minnie Osmond from Gambo. They're marking 52 years of marriage. Happy 71st anniversary to Ralph and Olive Fudge of Lewisport. Peter and Linda Bennett of Bishop's Falls are celebrating their 61st anniversary today. Wishing Norm and Agnes Collins of Portugal Cove St. Philip's a happy 50th anniversary. Happy 55th anniversary to Gordon and Elsie Vincent of Labrador City. Congratulations to Charlie and Peggy Kent of Belle Island. They're celebrating 50 years of marriage. Wishing Calvin and Marie Young a happy anniversary. They're also marking 50 years together. Now to some birthdays. Happy 101st birthday to Florence Baldwin of Jackson's Arm. Best wishes to Clarence Butler, also known known as Dar. It's his 90th birthday. Happy birthday to Geraldine Butler. She's also turning 90. Happy 98th birthday to Earl Lockyer in Paradise. Wishing Thelma Manning a happy 90th birthday. Best wishes to Ruth Hiscock on her 95th birthday. She's in Glover Town. Best wishes to Shirley Patricia Lundrigan, who is celebrating her 94th birthday tomorrow. Happy 90th birthday to Melvin Riggs from Brownsdale. Wishing William Cutler of Wareham a happy 92nd birthday. Happy 101st birthday tomorrow to Mary Lockyer of Garden Cove, now living in Clarenville. Birthday greetings going out to Alma King, who's turning 97 in CBS. Best wishes to Minnie Randall, who's celebrating her 96th birthday tomorrow in Mount Pearl. Happy 96th birthday also to Bill Tebow, who's known as the Family Crib Master. Happy 94th birthday today to Frank Pinsent of Grand Falls, Windsor. Happy 92nd birthday to Martha Smith of Brookside, now living in Mount Pearl. And happy 103rd birthday today to Yvonne Plowman of Portichois. Hope you have a wonderful birthday. Wow. 103. We've been getting some really impressive birthdays lately for sure. We certainly have. All right, so looking ahead to the long range forecast, um, things are warming up a bit. How are things yeah. looking into next week? Yeah, well, even warmer. In Ooh. fact, uh, I, we have quite a bit of snow on the ground here in St. John's, uh, about 15 centimeters of snow on the ground, but uh, I think it's going to take a hit, a little bit of a hit as we head through the next couple days. Let's take a look at what's going on uh, for your Saturday evening. Looking pretty nice. In fact, uh, we'll likely see some cloud cover lingering, but the winds will eventually ease off as we get into early Sunday morning. And we've got lots of cloud cover on the way for Labrador. That will be the story through a good chunk of the afternoon, but we'll start to see our next weather maker move in. And this is going to bring the chance of some showers and or flurries, maybe even some uh, at this point, some mixing it looks like it won't be uh, a lot that moves through, but we're still looking at the chance of some mixed precipitation for sure. It does look like some snow will develop as the afternoon rolls through and it might head towards the coast as well. So if you do uh, have any outdoor plans, you're definitely going to want to keep an eye on that one. Uh, but overall, the temperatures will be relatively mild, anywhere from about zero to minus three as your daytime highs up across Labrador, uh, a lovely day across the island. Uh, we may see some showers in the first half of the day, the morning probably uh, for the Avalon and then some late day showers uh, for the southwest. But other than that, you should actually see some sunshine through the day and your daytime highs will sit between zero and about plus two 
through your Sunday. Now, heading into uh, Sunday evening and then eventually into Monday, we will see some warmer air associated with that, so we'll likely see some shower activity. That will be the story for southeastern portions of Labrador and pretty much all across the island as we see southerly flow uh, move in. Temperatures are going to be quite warm through the day on Monday as well. And on the back side of this, though, we do still have some cold air, which will likely fall as snow uh, for portions of Labrador uh, with this one. So your daytime highs, 8 to 11 degrees on Monday. Uh, we're going to see those warm temperatures even uh, along the strait, and then southeastern Labrador will likely hit, sit between 3 and 5 degrees through the day. But again, uh, overnight or daytime highs rather in Lab City about minus six. So that warm air is going to continue through Tuesday. Then we will see those temperatures drop. It will be windy. It looks like at this point with shower activity uh, across St. John's and Eastern Newfoundland by Wednesday. We're looking at about one degree return of the chance of some showers or flurries. Similar warm up for uh, central and western Labrador or <laughs> the island, uh, but that temperature will drop at Tuesday right across the board uh, for you and then say about minus one uh, for Wednesday. And then for Labrador, you're looking at your temperature climbing to three on Monday, but dropping back down uh, in the east and much colder in the west with that chance of flurry sticking around through your Wednesday. Oh, I forgot to change oh. the weather photo. I had such a nice one, too. <laughs> it's so nice we get to see uh, it twice. It's, too. it's true. <laughs> it's the one we had last night. It is the one. I feel so bad because it's such a great weather photo today. That's oh, okay. It's okay. You can run it on Monday. I'll run it on Monday. Well, here's another shot. Andrew shared this one last <laughs> night and shared it again tonight. Thank you so much for that. If you have any weather photos you'd like to share with us, you can send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. All right. Before we finish up, uh, we're just a week away from our big Feed NL show at the Avalon Mall. We'll be there with our on-the-go colleagues from 4 to 7 on Friday and we'll be on TV a half an hour earlier at 5.30 Island Time, 5 o'clock uh, in most of Labrador. Yeah, so just join us throughout the month of December as we celebrate kindness and generosity with special programming and events in support of food banks. Yes, and you can support your local food banks by making a donation online. You can visit cbc.ca slash be kind. Well, that's it for us on this Friday evening. Hope you have a wonderful weekend. Good night.